Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name Kiafura Khan Tabiso Mohare, um, and uh, welcome to an exciting masterclass as part of the Basha Uhuru Festival 2020. An exciting program. We'd like to give a big shout out to uh, Constitution Hill. We'd like to give a big shout out to Basha Uhuru. Um, as well for giving us this platform. My job today is really quite easy. Um, I have the most uh, prestigious honor uh, of uh, introducing and facilitating a masterclass with uh, somebody who um, is controversial enough not to need an introduction, um, a legendary South African writer uh, by the name of Ndate Lesehorampuluke. We need to give this man his um, respect and his flowers while he's alive. So, um, we are grateful to, uh, you know, for him to offer us his time. Um, and the purpose of this masterclass really is uh, for young writers today um, who are gaining prominence, who have a lot more avenues to publish, a lot more avenues to get heard, to really go back, go back to the to the basics and 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 learn from those who have walked this road before you. Um, writing is also a learning experience, the lifelong learning experience. So there is no way you can say you are dope if you don't know where you come from. I challenge you to tell me that you are dope and you've never read any, any of um, the ancestry. I don't want to call it a canon. I call it an ancestry of South African um, uh, literature. So today, my job really is not to talk a lot. You know, you're not going to be seeing a lot of me. My job really is to um, introduce the man of the moment um, and to help facilitate his masterclass. So you will be seeing and hearing a lot more um, from him. So let me take this moment maybe to introduce him quickly and read his um, short bio. Uh, when people have done a lot in life, they deserve um, for their bios to be read. You know, we don't just say he's a writer, published author, mm -hmm. just like, you know, Lisa um, Rampulukeng is a poet and performance maestro um, and the author of 12 books, 12, Papa, 12. He has collaborated with visual artists, playwrights, filmmakers, theater and opera producers, poets and musicians. He ho he's no uh, holds barred style, radical political aesthetic perspective and instantly recognizable voice have brought him a unique place in South African literature. Since his debut, Horns of Hondo, in 1990, he has released several pioneering collections of poetry, including Talking Rains in 1993, The Bavino Sermons in 1999, The Second Chapter um, in 2003 and 5, and Head on Fire in 2012. His most recent collection, A Half a Century Thing, uh, which came out in 2015, won the National Institute for Humanities and Societal Sciences Award um, for best fiction. Um, he is the author of three novels, the most recent of which, uh, Bed Monk Seeding, 12 to, in 2017, presents a stark picture of life in a rural township two decades into South Africa's democracy and reinvokes the visions of pantheon of jazz, innovators, and radical writers. Rampolukeng has also written two plays, um, and has written screenplays and released several audio recordings. His documentary film, Word Down the Line, debuted in 2014. He's currently com completing a major study of the life and works of black consciousness poet and activist, activist Mafiga Pascal Koala. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Leseho Rampolukeng. Po, 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 po. I man, you corona fail at the ring. At the ring. Reatoba, here, Parnitati. Nagloreca, Caracana, Ribit, and Twin. Edit to Tinadi, Nadi, Quapala Club. Hey man, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this incredible bio of yours, even though I feel like, isn't there a few other things that have come since uh, this uh, this bio? The work on Mafiga Kuala, has it been completed? Maybe before we get into anything, our update, uh, where, where are you? What's the latest stuff you put out? Well, the thing is, um, 
the math figure koala thing is essentially not something that's supposed to be static, something put in a museum or a library or whatever. It's supposed to be a living library. So there's no way of actually completing it because we get to add other people's ideas about black consciousness, what black consciousness is, what it meant, what it will mean tomorrow if it's run its course, yep. and writings that were inspired by that period and by the man himself and the political yep. engagement, the yep. social and economic uh, issues that he dealt with. So that can never be completed. Mm -hmm. But as you know, that we hardly ever stop. Um, I think that the day I say, oh yeah, now, you know, I've found my voice, now I've arrived, oh, I've done it, is the day I stop writing, to be honest. Right. I, uh, I, what I do in life is a constant attempt to come to self, a constant attempt mm -hmm. to find my own voice. I mean, the mayor of Melville, you might know him, you might not. You know, once came to me and said to me, you know, writing poetry is very easy. When I was at university drinking with my friends, I'd get bored with what they were talking about. Go to my room, 10 minutes later, come back with a poem. And I thought, wow, this guy is a genius, you know? I mean, <laughs> the thing is, for some of us, we have to bleed. And even when the piece itself is published, you can't claim that it has been completed, you know? For some of us, we have to wade through mark through uh, debt, through blood, and we have to shed our skins along the way in order to create just one line of poetry. But some people are so, you know, blessed. They go to their room to the drunken stupor, scribble away and come back, and they were a pop. All good, man. <laughs> I can work. I want to say so. We have a video. I know. I want so can I go 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 the rings. I didn't know. Ramutse, Ramutse, but it's fine. Um, I think, um, for the sake of time, we only have an hour for this. Um, I would like you know to hand over the platform to you, really. Um, for you to to take us into your world. I have prepared four prompts. Uh, they're not really questions, but it's it's thought starters to really allow you to, to take us into your world, your mind, um, you know. Um, I will come in every now and then, maybe to bring in the next prompt, or how could you have something regarding the controversial but other than that, um, the, the space and time will largely, will largely be yours. So maybe then starting right from the top then, you know. Um, South African literature, according to Lese Horampolo King, uh, looking at history, impact, and importance. The stage is yours, Maestro. You know, I think it would be amiss for us to start talking about the history of South African literature without taking it right back to the caves, to the Khoisan people's scribblings on the walls. That was the first instance in, uh, in our history where we had what could be referred to as text, as script. But one has to also be um, of the mind that most of the greatest um, poets, for example, storytellers, creators of, of fictions, of worlds out there in this country never ever got to write down a single word. But we're dealing, I guess, here mainly with what constitutes text. Um, coming from the caves when you come this way, you find the missionaries pushing black people, particularly the indigenous people of this country, in a particular direction. Until you had black English ladies and gentlemen, even their writings hack back to England. But then, coming, okay, let me point something out that even though those people were creating within that space and using that mode of communication, that language, in the way in which their masters used it, they were still flipping things around. They were still dealing with the issues of the day, with socio-political issues. When Kai, for example, wrote his point, he was constantly in conflict 
with the rulers of the day. He wrote the poem about the king of England, which I believe up to today, we should be screaming from the balconies and the roofs of this country. But then, to, to put that aside a little bit, we came down from there then to the, to the salt blackies who is credited with having written, if not published, the first English language novel. Chinua Achebe is seen as the granddaddy of African literature, but the truth of it is the very first to do so was Saul Blackie. All right, moving on from there, we came to the Vilagazis, to the Shomos and such, who were actually RRR and uh, HIE Jomo were two strands that seemed to be in conflict. They were brothers, yes, sure, but they were coming from different angles. The one pushing on from the missionary stuff was pushing a Christian mode of life, very moralistic. Some of the stuff, if you were to read it, would make you cringe, to be honest. But still, that's uh, one of our four best. Beyond that, then we had uh, the drum generation. Ken Temba, Casey Muzizi, Net Nakasa, and so forth. Ezekiel Pathede also was one of them, who were mainly inspired, in my view, by Americanism, by the jive talk of the Americans, by uh, the speed, flip, and dribble of American life. They tried, however, to make it resonate, to make it have sense for their locale, for wherever they were placed, which happened to be so far town now. They engaged, of course, in the broader society of South Africa. Beyond that, coming this way, Shabville happened, and so we had poetry such as that, which was written by Abdullah Ibrahim. Most people know Abdullah Ibrahim as a jazz musician. Not too many people know Abdullah as a poet. And so, as I lead up to that, I'd like to read just part of a poem of Abdullah Ibrahim. It's called uh, Blues for District 6 because it'll open up something I want to talk about later on, about people talking about how we shouldn't write about flowers in times of war, in times of destitution, of oppression, repression, when we've got our noses stuck in the mud and a chat boot at the back of our heads. My take has always been this. We can write about flowers at counterpoint with biological warfare, with how the state of those flowers is actually a reflection of our own lives. As they tumble down, wrinkle and die off, so do we essentially, because of the poisons in the atmosphere, because of the bombs that get strewn across the world. So I think, we shouldn't be reductionist in how we approach the material with which we speak. Anyway, Abdullah Ibrahim here writing about the destruction of District 6. Instead of saying, oh, the bulldozers came, oh, there were all these rocks falling, people screaming, grabbing their belongings, etc. He approaches it lyrically in this manner. Dollar brand, Abdullah Ibrahim from Africa Music and Show Business. Lose for District 6. Early one New Year's morning, when the Emerald Bay waved its clear waters against the noisy dockyard, a restless southeaster skipped over slumbering lamb's head, danced up Hanover Street, turned out a body banjo, strung an ancient cello, bridged a host of guitars, tambourine through a dingy alley into a scented cobwebbed room, and crackled the sixth sensed district into a blazing swamp fire of certain sound. Early one New Year's morning, when the morning bay mourned in murky waters against the deserted dockyard, a bloodthirsty southeaster roared over hungry lion's head and posted its way up Hanover Street, empty, forlorn, and cobwebbed with gloom. Now, what Abdullah is doing there is take the state of things and spin it into a musical orchestration. First part of it, he talks about the sweetness, the fineness of things, the silkiness of things, how good things were. And then this happened, this rupture 
in the lives of the people of District 6. And it became forlorn, it became hungry, it became growling, it became man-eating. That is the way poetry functions. Okay. Um, well, we, we were still trying to take it from the cave to wait and sound, right? Yes. That I think would be the time for me. Anyway, um, subsequent to, to Abdullah Ibrahim, James Matthews, who, who really stands as as a great symbol of South African literature, over and above his writing himself, he was the first person to, uh, to the first black person to open a strictly black publishing house. And it, it was actually called that black without the K at the end. Now, James Matthews came out actually speaking out against even the very idea of poetry. He said that poetry is all about, you know, I'm paraphrasing, hugging flowers, etc., being marshmallow people, and that's not his idea of poetry. His poetry serves as a weapon, as something that his people could work with and use towards their liberation. Right? So James Matthews can actually be seen as the father of, of the crop that came after, which was comprised of people like Mungano Walisi Rote, Mafiga Koala, James Smith, no, 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 uh, Mafiga Koala, um, Sipos Pamla, for example. Now, for me, what was interesting in the quest for a strictly land bound, this land bound um, poetic was that Sirote came out titling his first book, Yakalinkomo. Instead of saying the cry of the bull or cow or whatever, you know, like, uh, like his uh, little English ladies and gentlemen forebears. But then even as I say so, I'm not really spitting on their graves because even when they were working with E in the confines of the canon, they were speaking back to the empire, as they say, the empire strikes back, whatever. Yeah, 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 that's where it started. They were doing that. They were just confined in what they did with language. And one doesn't blame them, of course. They had what they could work with. You say, when you started out, you had these texts to look up to. So it makes sense why you would sound like that. The same thing with them. Now we're talking about the form, not the content. The content itself was striking out against that, you know, but it carried quite a lot of uh, missionary inspired ideas and concerns, etc. It was like people are uh, hoping that Jesus would strike against Pharaoh, which was uh, these people who were oppressing them. Let's leave that aside. Um, Mafiga Koala, also, it's a pity, man. His one poem I would have wanted to share is a bit too long to take up too much of the space here, which I think really exemplifies that period, getting off the ride. I think people should seek it out and read it for themselves. Okay, but then while these are my fathers, these are people I looked up to actually. I see them as the fathers of what I came out to do, particularly Mafia Kwan. But that didn't stop them from falling prey to criticism by a younger generation coming after them. Pele Madingwani, Maishi Maponya, and Matsimela Malaka, et cetera. Ingwa Pele Madingwani, Africa my beginning, you know. They came from the West sailing to the East with hatred and disease flowing from their flesh and a burden to harden our lives. Beautiful, hardcore. They, they accused the generation before of hiding behind language, you know, trying to, to uh, shape whatever it is they wanted to use as a form of weaponry against the oppressors in sweet, well-molded language. No, no, no. They were out with their spears. I mean, Lefifi Tadi came out also before them, actually. Lefifi was just immediately after Bosi Rote had said, we are the elephant, you know, like, marching through. So even the the um the imagery the metaphors there pointed is you know uh fighting talk ready to pull down the building stuff which wasn't really what we were doing 
The other way of doing it was extremely important, but these other guys were actually cutting out all access, what they saw as excess baggage and getting to what they deemed um, the point. Okay, subsequent to that came Borona, but kept said, you know, uh, we drew from these guys, but our concerns, I think, well, took it to other directions, whether those directions were okay, whatever. But, uh, you know, the times dictated that. Just like the times dictated those people, right, like they did, our times dictated. And I'm not trying to say it was all homogeneous, that we were all a blob, everybody was writing like this. No. Um, for example, I'll give a piece that see Tamo Mutsaku, you know, was of the generation of Nkoli Sinyez, or for example, myself, a little piece that he wrote. It's not long. Solo. My love, there are no accidents in war. No kisses on the belligerent lips of crocodiles. No loves greener than the dancing hearts of children. No reveler jollier than the worm in Columbus's boiling head. There are no songs beautifuler than the stern indifference of the hills. There are no flowers more clamorous than the seas of children home in my little heart. I tell you this as the sun recedes into the quaking pinstripe of my warriors, grinning and vulgar in their muddy dreams of power. I tell you this, love, because the roads have become hostile. Now, that's the poetry well. An example of the poetry I regard as uh, the poetry of emergency. It was created during the states of emergency coming this way. Had people like Sandy Le Dikeni, you know, Guava Jews writing about the throwing of petrol bombs, etc. We had uh, Bud Comrie, who was the loudest of the Lord. I, you know, I always defend the guy myself. To be honest, I always defend him. I say, look, man, not even in Wapele Marimwani had as great an impact as the guy. We can scream about the quality of the writing, etc. But the point is, he did come through and managed to be embraced by a multitude. You want to respect that, you know. Just like you want to respect the other guy's hustle. Hey, respect good comrade. <laughs> it's all good. All right, from there on, we birthed the generation subsequent to that. That's why you can have yourself, for example, you can have uh, Gift, Ramashia, Makafula Villagas. We, we will get talking about it, I hope, when we get to the issue of language. I, I do hope we get to it because I think it's essential for us. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about the impact of South African literature, first of all, let me point out something that I don't recognize the borders of this country. They were not created by the people of this country. They were created in Berlin at the Berlin Conference when uh, cannibals of Europe didn't fit to share out the continent among themselves. So when I'm talking about this poetry here, I also include the poetry of Razia Setako from Botswana, who played what was called the Sekhaba and recited his poetry over it. For me, I can make the argument that it is precisely because of the kind of music and poetry marriage that people like Raja Sitaku created that we had across the pond in Jamaica, for example, someone called Daddy Uroy, who's seen as the father of the reggae DJs who toasted and dropped um, poetry lines on top of reggae instrumentals or dub versions as, as it was called. And from there, well, it was Daddy Uroy, Iroy, people followed him, big youth. From there, it traveled across to the USA and found people like the last poets who did their poetry to the accompaniment of drums. We had Gil Scott Heron, who recorded the classic, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, and they are seen as having kick-started what became rap music. So we can actually draw a line from across this continent, going that way, going that way, and coming right back to today what people are doing the spoken word poetry. Um, the sad aspect of that, though, was that it's almost straight certain people when it came right back 
of of the identity for example and this is not to set anybody off the bad way but we had um coming down the line from amiri baraka we had nikki giovanni and nikki giovanni was very popular putting her poetry to music and whatever and then we saw in south africa little nikki giovanni is jumping up sadly they didn't get to shed the nikki giovanni influence we'll talk about influence versus mimicry down the line i hope please prompt me when we get to that and we had saul williams that's now a classic example of how many saul williams you had in this country your question though was about the impact south african writing itself had on the world when for example you uh, you look at somebody like uh, sterling d plump who could write a collection called johannesburg and other poems utilizing south site specific issues images name places people's names and you have uh, Kamau Braithwaite, whose poem Soweto actually used the, uh, the Iskosa language within its mist, somewhere within its body. It used directly Iskosa. Then you begin to realize just how much this country has impacted, not only politically, but artistically on the rest of the world. You can go to Europe. Uh, to England, for example, where Linton Gracie Johnson resides, and talk to him about the impact South African politics and South African literature had. We had Jean Winter Breeze also, who we brought down here some years ago. Sadly, she couldn't perform. No, I think, I think thank you for, for, for then bringing it a whole, um, um, completing the timeline, you know, which then nicely segues into the next prompt, which is the purpose and task of writers and literature in this day and age, according to Lesoho Rambulukeng. I mean, earlier we had touched on the concept of mimicry and mediocrity. And I think in your own story, you you also um, you know illustrated how you know certain voices that came before you were your fathers and you were inspired and influenced by them and you drew from them um, as well. And I know, I mean, you know, the concept of mimicry and medio mediocrity, especially with this generation, has been so widely debated and 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 you know controversial issue, but if we then have to start from here, looking at these voices, your gifts, your colleagues, you know, there's a whole new generation of writers that uh, um, your generation has brought forth, then what becomes the purpose and task of the writer and, and, the, and their literature then? Okay. Well, first of all, um, I'm not a cultural commissar, so I don't go about making proscriptions and saying to people, no, you're a writer, you should be doing X, Y, Z. I do what I do, I regard myself as a writer of social conscience. Somebody can write about marshmallows or chup-chupim natika thing or whatnot, you know. Some people can go and be marshmallow warriors in something. That, that's okay, you know, you hit them, absolutely nothing happens. The fist just goes into the marshmallow, springs right out, everybody walks away. It's okay, as long as, as long as, I mean, people could write about their dog, Snoopy, or Brownie, or whatever, as long as that is a distillation of their universe, as long as they are so submerged within that, that it becomes them, and it comes from within them. If that's what they feel, that the crux of their existence is to be found in their dog, Snoopy, and what Snoopy represents. I'm okay with that. I just am inspired in another direction altogether. All of that is valid. Somebody said everything is valid in poetry. Well, I believe that every single instance of lived reality is valid, is food for writing. If somebody thinks that uh, their world revolves around Bukotan, and they write about that. I respect it as long as it is real, as long as it is true to their existence, as long as it's not a show being put on for me. Now, on the issue of mimicry, look, was it Charlie Parker who said, when he was asked to give advice to young musicians, and he said, you know, look, what you have to do is to learn the inner uh, mechanizations 
of your instrument. Learn everything about your instrument, what it can do, what it can do, what other people have done with it. Learn. That's the only way to learn. Just make sure you get to know every single thing about your instrument. It's history. Everything that defines that instrument. Once you've learned it, forget all that learning and just play. For me, that is what's of essence within writing. Yes, read as much as you can. But I have to point something out again. I mean, when we teach creative writing, the first thing we say, you can't be a writer if you don't read. Yes, indeed. You've got to read as much as you possibly can. Not in order to absorb that and try to recreate it or whatever. No, no. Uh, Cervantes was a great writer. Goethe was great. Shakespeare was great. Yes. I respect that, but I don't want to be them. I've read them, and I read every single thing I can lay my hand on cartoons, I read the Bible, I read everything. Not so much to walk along that line, but just so that I know how much ground has been covered in order to strike out my own path, you know. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it there. Now, the issue of, of, of the, uh, the writer's task, look, in prose, one can act like they're splashing paint on a canvas, right? That's fine. That's cool. Creating a picture for me to uh, receive in whatever way I do. In poetry, the idea is to cut off all excess connective tissue, all fat and whatever, and reduce, reduce the entire matter, your entire scope of life to the tip of the pen, so that your entire universe is distilled in the moment of the creation of the poem. For me, that is the task of the writer, to arrive at that moment, not to go around writing. Look, you can be a pamphleteer. Go and write pamphlets. Go and write, you know, banners. Yeah, Dowry, Brackenfell, whatever. That's cool, you know. But that is not what constitutes poetry. Yes, those things are part of our lives. Yes, they affect us. Everything that happens, every word heard, every smell, the, you know, the, the stench of a rotting dog in the field, you know, um, the um, curry in your kitchen, the toilet that's blocked, you know, uh, the sewer that we trudge through, the pus that spits out of wounds that you've got, the sight of them, all of those things come to bear on the poet when the poet writes. I don't wake up in the morning and say, ah, oh, today I'm going to write a poem. No, 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 I'm going to write a short story. That's not it. I think the writing determines itself and in the same way, the writer's readers will be found by the poem. No point in running around and shopping. I mean, nowadays, even when I try to give people my books as a gift, they run away, you know, let alone not buying the stuff. I mean, I've, 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 I've had the privilege of, of reading some of your books. I remember reading Black Heart and going, I need to have a conversation with this man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Um, on the matter of language, according to the Sohora Bulu Gang, uh, this is also a very heated topic. If you take the South African context, especially, uh, there's still a massive debate around. Uh, we should be relearning our languages, writing in them. Um, some writers are of the view of uh, uh, we must, uh, you know, own language and tear it apart and twist it and conform it and turn it into what we want it to be, you know. Um, so it's a quite a broad spectrum. So the matter of language, according to the Sahara Buluke. You know, what has always struck me about this issue is that whenever people talk about it, they always refer to Ngugi, you know, and it, it makes me sick, actually, that issue. First of all, not to cast aspersions at the father, not to sling mud or whatever. But honestly, Ngugi Wationgo could afford to give up writing in English. Look, Ngugi could write in dog fat. It'll still be translated. Okay? So we can't be saying to young people, no, don't. Come on. Okay, let's leave the old man alone. That's, that's all fine. It's perfect. 
I write in my idea of whatever this language is that we're using. You know, people tell you it's English, but there are many Englishes in the world. In England itself, there are many Englishes. Somebody in Manchester and somebody in Liverpool, someone in London. Also, a specific corner of London speaks a different language. Okay, now that's us still in England. And what is English? What is English but the most bastard language on earth? The English language is a compound, it's made up of various languages, some of them Germanic, etc. You know, even the, 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 the little, uh, um, what's it called, Latin thrown in, a little bit of French and whatever, kindergarten. That's a German way. You know, okay, it's German. So when people shout out against English, I always just want to ask them, which English are you talking about? But that's okay. We can, we can agree. Fine. Okay. Yes, this English language that we're supposed to be fighting against. Now, here's my thing. You know, I'm all for the preservation of our indigenous languages. Yes. But then again, the question is, why don't I write in one of them? It's simply this, that I respect my languages enough not to want to pull a hustle in them, okay? If I tried to write in the language of my mother, I'd be doing it a great disservice. Now, let's go to my home, for example. My name is in Setswana, right? But neither one of my parents actually uses that language. When my mother talks to her husband, my father, He'll be like to hey, you, hey, what la la di like fan Joe, da 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 da. Hey, hey, I always chaneening and whatever. Now, what is my mother tongue? Tell me. Also, now when I'm at home, right? I've got two sisters. One is eight years younger than me. The other one, sixteen years younger than me. When they converse, sometimes I have to step in and ask them exactly what they are saying because I don't really get it. And when I talk with my mates, guys, I grew up with on the Pefeni Street corner, they can't understand, they can't follow what we're saying. Now, if I were to say a mother tongue, that would be that language that I grew up speaking with the people on my corner. No, not the whole of Orlando West, no, that little Pefeni corner. When we spoke, people from across the tracks could hardly follow what we were saying, but we tried to find a way to maneuver so that everyone can communicate. Now, if I were to write in it, what exactly would I, who would I be writing to? My three friends on the corner there, because they'd be the only ones who'd be able to follow it. You know, what's what? Of what consequence is that? All right. Now, there's a flip side to that. Let me start off by, 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 by reading a Sipos Pamela piece, which tries to work, which tries to speak in the voices of the land, okay? Because it will open up something else I want to talk about. In line with this, we're not running away from the language issue because I think it's important. Man. I think it's really important now. Uh, I'm going to struggle finding this. Anyway, um, we have to draw a line from, for example, him, Sipos Pamla, right down to Makapula Villagas and how he's writing and why. But we can't do that without going via um, who's now in parliament, the communist. He wrote something called Obra Billy Balanski's Legacy. Okay. From there, we get to Ike Mueller. Now, I, I, wrote, I, wrote, I, wrote, I, wrote, I wrote a review of Ike's book, and Ike's mates you know, whispered in his ear that I was dissing him and whatever. You know? And Ike is my boy, man. Found Ike at the, at the market lab. There's a student that went to do a workshop there. It got so inspired. You know, come on, that's right. Man. You, you say these beautiful things, you know, present them as poetry. Why then would I be knocking him? But the point I was making was simply this. Of his generation, Ike, nobody speaks in the way in which he writes. Nobody. The people who are the same age as his father, spoke like that. Yeah. Uh, Ploma Matala, Ploma, make it so text and terrorist ban and the dome. That's, that's so fire town speak, okay? I respect that he's preserving that, but nobody should tell me that that's the language of the Mufolo street in which he lives today. It's not true. 
Makafula Vidagazi, yes. Okay, we'll get to that point. Because it, it's important man, how we look at it. You can't just celebrate something, Jay, without trying to look critically at it. That's why we've ended up with this mediocrity. I haven't said that word once today. You're the one who said it, mediocrity. But I love it. I love it. Some of my best friends are mediocre. I can tell you that. Um, while you're trying to find C post Pamela, uh, Makafula Villagas, I mean, you said Makafula Villagas. Now, that's a different story, you know, and I'm privileged to know and, you know, and have, have experienced his work. What for you makes somebody like Makafula Villagas, who, I mean, going back to your point of, you know, what's the point of using language that no one else beyond your three friends is using? Um, you know, what are you really going to reach? But Makafula, his choice of language is, a, is very interesting. What, what makes him special for you? Well, you, you know, um, here's the thing. The question is actually broader than, than, than we made it out to be right now. Here's something else. I mentioned Mkai earlier, right? We could mention Tatenzani. You could mention whoever, right? Or four bears. Now, I live in the Eastern Cape. And up to today, I mean, after years and years, I'm yet to come across somebody who actually speaks in the way in which Mkai wrote. Mkai wrote in, um, in the language with whatever nuances, etc., of his specific time and place. Now, if we're going to say, oh, uh, let us drag this language from Kai's time to here, whatever, as though it's this petrified thing that's frozen and locked in time. That language is not, language is not static. Language is dynamic. Language changes daily, actually. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the Northwest now. And the Setswana that I encounter is not the same Setswana I found in Botswana and Khaburoni. It is not. Even within Khaburoni itself, different modes of usage of that language exist. So what are we really saying? Uh, are you, am I being asked now to uh, go and dig up what was, was written and said in 1820 and drag it 200 years this way and speak? Who does speak like this? Who does? For me, I respect somebody who attempts to grapple with the modes of communication that they themselves engage in and the people they engage with. I respect it. And I think Makafula has gone some way towards that. My fear is where does someone like that go from there? Fine. Okay, this is great, you know. Cool. Great. This really captures a moment in our history. But then where do you take that? Do, is there anything to subvert beyond that? I'm not saying that's a dead end. I'm saying I'm looking with great interest to see if there's any possibility of growth beyond that moment. Anyway, um, to illustrate the point of the usage of language, and this, this was written sometime in the 80s, by the way. Statement, the Dodger, that's Sipos Pamla. I Kemos, this world in a dozal. This fellow doing did he speak about dim I'm used to him galowe. You're going to see every day on the street. He comes to me one day, you know, the same way, I'll be alright tomorrow, Jack. He says, Dimti Poro E5 Pop, who's on duty, fix up on a Friday, class it meet again on the way. I man, I don't give land to a second thought. Dimti Piti Umtugatiko. Galen Wondoga, blessed is he that gives. That Hua E5 Pop out of my pocket, that it give to him. Next thing I walk away. Two, three weeks go by. Let Chap it disappear. Not a ghost sign of him anywhere. Okay, what is five bob these days the cost of living? One can't even buy snuff galo amount. One Saturday afternoon, the Saturday relaxed near friends of mine, one Mrs. January. 
the next door neighbor got Mrs. May. We were doing was a two, was a four. He said she am a daughter and a public opinion. In walks this fellow. What Kalelega, I tell you. The people then go love and peace and in the land and the Ashusha, drunk as a sailor, I tell you. He fellow, he doesn't see me. Whether fair or file, I didn't know. What is that to be owner of the joint? One Scotch here, Tony Walker, I jumped up and said, Counting at the putting a lap herself. Hey, what is a little reply? Don't be funny. That is, take five. Ahead of a club play. Women started to scream. That is, take six. A club plus dumpty point in your one finger. Everybody grabbed my hands. I told them straight, let guy it take advantage of me. It a four or five bob from me the other day long ago. And it promised we to return on a Friday soon, soon. Now grass has grown under my feet. I don't like promises, especially from people who drink whiskey. I came on, this world is real funny. Now, the point I'm trying to make with it is, I've heard people speak like that. I've heard um, people, I mean, because of speaking messes, you know, walking down the street and me as a little boy running past them. Here and express themselves pretty much like that. Like I said, I was in, in, the, in, the, in the Eastern Cape and people do speak a, a version of that. Of course, it can't be the same. He was, he was a Pinoni guy, you know, etc. cetera. Oh, 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 that's it. You know, that's it. That's speaking in the voices of the land. I'm not saying everybody should. With this so-called English, well, whatever, offshoot of it we've got. We can create a language that speaks to all of us right here. You see, the thing is, even as I uh, celebrate Makavula, for example, um, I'm wondering in the Val, for example, or crossing over into the suit, if people would understand him. We do not have a South African, like the Jamaicans do, for example, or the Nigerians with their pigeon. Everybody speaks that language from uh, the people in the, in the markets to the university professors who can twing and twang whenever they feel like it. When they do have to communicate, even though there are all these various languages in Nigeria, there is that one that everybody can use to communicate. I dream of the day when we can have such as South Africans. Maybe the last uh, that's in prompt to the young writer. Um, Lesser Horampolo King says. Aha. All right. Um, let me kickstart that by, by reading this little piece that was written by somebody I respect quite a lot, not South African, Charles Bukowski, American, okay? Giving advice to young writers. I'll say something after that, but here we go. So you want to be a writer. If it doesn't come bursting out of you in spite of everything, don't do it. Unless it comes unasked out of your heart and your mind and your mouth and your gut, don't do it. If you have to sit for hours staring at your computer screen or hunched over your typewriter searching for words, don't do it. If you're doing it for money or fame, don't do it. If you're doing it because you want women in your bed, don't do it. If you have to sit there and rewrite it again and again, don't do it. If it's hard work just thinking about it, don't do it. Don't do it if you're trying to write like somebody else. Forget about it. Oh, God, wait. Ah, oh, sorry, man. You see, technology. All right, I'll pick it up from there. If you have to wait for it to roll out of you, then wait patiently. If it never does roll out of you, do something else. If you first have to read it to your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your parents or to anybody at all, you're not ready. Don't be like so many writers. Don't be like so many thousands of people who call themselves writers. Don't be dull and boring and pretentious. Don't be consumed with self-love. The libraries of the world have yawned themselves to sleep over your kind. Don't add to that. 
Don't do it unless it comes out of your soul like a rocket, unless being still would drive you to madness or suicide or murder. Don't do it. Unless the sun inside you is burning your gut. Don't do it. When it's truly time, and if you have been chosen, it'll do it by itself. And it'll keep on doing it until you die or it dies in you. There's no other way. And there never was. Now, advice to young writers. That's essentially what I'll be saying. Take that and take from Charlie Park about learning everything you can about your craft, working at your craft. You know, there's never a perfect piece, honestly. Every single piece of writing can be critiqued. Now, um, the, the thing to do is to, like I said, we bleed some of us. You know. Some of us actually literally. There's a point in which I was, I was reading something, not just writing actually, and I bled from my fingers here, you know, and the blood fell onto the page between two lines written by Pablo Neruda. You know. But anyway, that was a beautiful poem that it fell on. I just believe that people sometimes come to writing for the wrong reason. You know, okay, he says if you're doing it for fame and whatever. But I heard one guy saying he gave up trying to be an MC. Now he's a poet because in poetry, no one can accuse him, accuse him of biting. And I was like, wow, I've never heard that before, man. <laughs> I really have never heard that before. I believe that some people, like at Word and Sound, for example, you know, I go and I, and I ask myself, look, once, let's leave Word and Sound a little bit out of the picture. I went with Jose Zile to a reading in, in Pretoria somewhere. And I can assure you that, say, I can't remember the number. Let's just for argument's sake say there were 16 poets. If I had sat there with my eyes closed throughout that entire period, I would have thought I was listening to the same person. Unless, of course, there's a change in terms, ah, now that's a woman now. Oh, okay, so there are two people. There's a guy and there's a woman. Meanwhile, there were 16 people in total. That is a great example of this mimicry we're speaking about. If Saul Williams does this thing like that, and people think, wow, it's taking over the world, <laughs> I'll be a South African Saul Williams. You know, I'll be some little uh, Chicago and New York guy lost in the streets of Halishiwe. That is what I'm talking about. But like I said, we're not talking just about influences from across the waters, from here also. I mean, I could name some people, little Mzwakis that ran around here. When we're coming up, we say, because We've got these people operating out of the University of Cape Town, you know, which is the last bastion of Imperial England, who came out like Stephen Watson made an unfortunate statement in the 70s that there was no black poet in this country. There just wasn't. By which he meant none of them slotted in nicely between Mrs. and Bass in the writing of their poetry. So their writing was invalid. That's what he said. You know, so we came out fighting there. We said these people are not equipped to critique us. And I think we won that battle. But because we won that battle, it had some negative uh, results that everyone thought, ah, so there are no standards in poetry, meaning I can jump up and be a poet. So everybody and their grandmother became a poet. And that was unfortunate. And everyone started thinking, oh, the louder you do it and with this team, with this texture of voice, that makes it poetry. And I see that happening also, you know, where people believe, okay, here, this poem, I want to take a deep breath. You know, oh, this calls for a sigh. And da, da, da. I've seen that. This person comes at this specific moment, very well rehearsed, sigh. Oh. <laughs> That's not the poetry. Let the work speak, please, please. That's now. That's the advice I can give. That you know, your voice will come. Patience, respect the word, and the more you respect the word, is the more it'll respect you in turn. 
and love you. Show it all the love you can, the compassion you can, you know, empathy, everything that's positive. It might hurt you. You might come away bruised and battered and whatever, but the results of it will be the beauty that you can then share with those of us who are willing to receive it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask you to read us something to close, but before that, uh, MCs have ciphers. What do poets have? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Ah, oh, you know, this is, this reminds me of something. Um, I had to give a, a keynote address some at Jaius, you know, at the University of Johannesburg. And someone said something about slam poetry. And I said, there's no such thing as slam poetry. Slam is a concept. Slam is not, um, a sub body of poetry, like people can say there's dark poetry. There's, there is no such thing as slam poetry. What happened was, in New York, this you know, uh, at, the, at the New York and Poets Cafe, people are just hosting what could be called contests, okay? This poet comes up, reads their stuff, the other one comes up, and the audience decides, you know, who they go with and whatever. That's their concept. It's not the poetry itself, but if it's written like this, it's a slam poem, you know? But this person got very angry with me, claiming that a slam poet. I said, what does that mean, essentially, you know? I understand this petal rap, that's specific. This MC stands there, you stand here, ta -da -da, you tell him how wack he is and whatever, and he throws. I understand that also, you know? But the concept of slam poetry, I understand the slam. Ah, the slam happening, right. But give me a poem that is a slam poem, please. Say, here's a slam poem. I'd be happy. I, I want to learn. I'd be happy, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you took it in that direction. OK. Mm -hmm. I was saying, I'm glad you took it in that direction, you know, um, because again, yeah, the, the concept of uh, so-called, I mean, to this day, I still get called and, hey, we're looking for slam poets. And I'm like, there are no such things as slam poets. Um, so thank, thank you for, I think, once again, uh, clarifying that matter. I think there's a lot of young people who, you know, it, 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 it's, and, and, and it's used, it's used um, 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 uh, freely, you know, uh, slam poetry, slam poets, um and and yeah sometimes it, 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 it embarrasses us um, and shows just how little we know of the history of the instrument that we are trying to 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 master you know so thank you for 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 clarifying that i hope it's clear now there is no such thing as a slam poem okay there are no slam poets there's a thing called a poetry slam which is a competitive format of sharing poetry and okay. points matter but there is no format called slam poetry. So could you please share with us maybe one or two poems in closing uh, before we thank you and let young people go and go burn everything they've written because they've just realized that uh, Chair Hohab, I'm not a poet. <laughs> um, okay, I just want to do the two, two little pieces, you know, very different. The one I guess I want to do because I got kicked out of Rhodes University, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, well, you know, man, it doesn't matter how well you do your job, how great a teacher you might be or whatever. This thing is a super structure, it's massive. You can go with your hammer and chisel and whatever and start knocking on the walls or whatever, you're not going to be affecting it in any particular way. It's just true. Anyway, my Rhodesian rent, dedicated to Sizzle John Rhodes. Not rhyming, son, and venomation. This. The schemes are toxin, cerebration poison. Intellect crack like chest plate back in full metal jacket talk. Santa Puss and Father Pismas bring disease as present. Count down to our ah, mama. Get on this. Horsemen of the epoch eclipse, keep my name off your pop lips. 
Peace in your uterus, peace on the mattress, each a piece of the universe. Gift of the rabbit, I got that. Next up, my mongrel tomes. My generation break bitten into line. Obscenity heritage, pornography pageantry, sir, fecal and cum stains post bomb invasion. Never call seminars with my ancestry. Thus, my telescopes, your rectal probes. Superstars, asteroids or asteroids and humoroids all things i try to avoid now time has stuck a fist so far up my rectum it's waving amanda out of my mouth what a boneless slogan to chew thus cecilia joan rhodes pissed to meet you dread professor at your cervix all right Next, oh, 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 oh. next please, to close this off because it speaks about where this poetry thing comes from. Okay, people will be asking, yo, um, do you start with, with a title? Do you start with a line? Do you start with a word or whatever? I got tired of being asked that question. I decided to write, you know, it's pretty much my, uh, my ask poetica. Yes, they say. It begins with sound. No little bob peeping snitch, but I come in, blowing horns for hondo against these Jericho walls of ghettoization. Cause in the beginning was the acoustics, a wet horde hiding in the keyboards. Thus it is, earth belly bound bass and rim shots sprung from electric drum clouds. Guitar line, that's a reed riding black lightning. Organic sound, what I'm stringing, it bounced back on interplanetary sonic springs. Grandpapa Khoisan cave, the echo chamber. Who cares what my voice is timber? I'm the raw that came before the sun, the fire soul of Fanon's children, the purulent soul that got the reverend chicken scratch and run. There where we end beginnings, the second chapter of the book in ashes, the Bavino sermon on the monster mount, a black hat bunt to ghost talking rain to white hat, it begins with sound. My verbs, the Val River reverb, flow like the main artery best. Nouns, bounce of the Karoo moon. Body canoe mind, rise high fell to Platteland. Multipolar and polyrhythmic aligned. Solar systematic beam poet raised with the desert sun. Public address cable melt from hissing volcanic tones of skeleton coasted, gold dusted, diamond busted, blood, brain, flesh, and bones as I rest my veins upon the Kalahari descends. My scriptures, pictures, sutures for my sounds, wounds, psyche bound, it begins with sound. What news comes with a locust plague in shiny shoes while I hum grimy blues of abandoned farmsteads and abandonment in palm spreads, follow the ponds, riverine threads, they are seminal threads, leading from here back to Ratsia Sikako 4. As Bosman wrote, Africa is the genius among the continents. I embrace this. Drink inspiration from the number one chalice. Her blood provides my ink. Her wretched body is the debauch rendered inanimate my canvas. Salvaged after the colonial cannibal feast. Not experiencing politics or the dependency, economics, glamour sellers, romanticized. Rama selawe, wana wala. Mozzarella, Sanko Mota, Orlando West Hemistris Magistus, working the alchemic out of waters of slaughter, dynamic, futuristic, not stuck in romantic past, still toad butt kick against stagnant presence. It begins with sound, got the microphone wire mesh soaking from centuries of bleeding. I'm bringing vocal cords, magma bubbling away. Some use it for hate. Me, it is to self-dedicate. Mental construction, working emotional hydraulics. Flip it cyberitic and arid, stormy and temperate. Fluid in flight, both outward bound and meteorite. The verger in a 16 bar measure. A cranial hidden treasure. Rhymes variant as the climactic lay of my prostituted poet republic. Blessed and cursed intent to the page I come. Amniotic, mutant, fallen off the literary conveyor belt. They milk the system. I've gone trans lactation. Need nothing corporate, no transaction to feed optimal consciousness. No freestyling in golden chains. I go specializing in molding brains, bareback riding senses, sipping deluded pretenses out of denuded veins. It begins with sound.
It begins with sound indeed. Um, the Sikhoram Polukeng, poet and performance maestro, author of 13, of 12 books. Oh, clearly there's a 13 that needs to come here, you know. My, my voice, it says 13. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your talent. Thank you for your spirit, for your generosity. Um, thank you for making time for reminding us for a this is fun but it's also not a game you know uh as what you say as you were as you were reading there that uh, there's a lot of rappers that you could just kill in jail without even uh, you know without even trying a lot of uh, rappers on channel o and mtv base <laughs> that you could <laughs> maybe that, that's what we need to do we need to adopt rappers in this country and uh <laughs> and bring them a little bit closer to the craft you know um, okay. Any last words uh, as we close? On your I'll side. just say, yeah, like man, um, happy writing. That's all I can say. Even though for some people it's, thera it's therapeutic. Okay, fine. But for some of us, we either write or die. That's it. Like you're saying, it's fun. Sometimes it is fun. I mean, why? Do it if you can't get any fun out of it or whatever. But it's a death zone sometimes. It's a war zone. People's lives rise or fall depending on the way and the way in which it's used. For example, the, um, the Nazis, it's not because of the armaments they had. It's not because of whatever power they had in terms of money or whatever that they could managed to do what they did. It is because of the utilization of the word. How the word can affect people's minds and behavior and channel them towards a specific direction. Poetry is not a bulletproof vest, you know? My poetry is not going to stop somebody firing an R1 at me. You know, I have the poetry stand there and save me or whatever. And my poetry is also not going to be a pang hacking somebody's head despite whatever Miri Baraka might have said, we want poems that kill, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. He was using it figuratively. A poem cannot literally do that. That's a fact. But what it can do is change mindset. It inspire people or bring them down. It can liberate. It has liberatory potential, but it can also be used for the oppression of masses of people. So our choices lie therein somewhere as writers. Not said, his name is the Sekhoram King, absolute legend, icon. If you didn't know, now you know. Um, if you've never read his work, now you must go find the work and read it. If you've never seen him live, when COVID is done, you need to. You need to go see him. Um, thank you for a wonderful masterclass. Um, this has been um, a masterclass, writing masterclass with the Sekhoram King as part of uh, Basha Uhuru Festival 2020. Thank you to Basha Uhuru for the opportunity. Thank you to Constitution Hill um, for allowing us to bring um, such madness into, into their space as well. Check out the rest of the program for the festival as well. My name is Afura Khan, and as we usually say, in word and sound, we trust. Salute. Bless it.